our Market Moves segment today. I'm joined by Jeff Cohn, our Chief Investment Officer and CFA Charter Holder. On this segment, we're going to discuss risk in financial markets and the importance of risk in selecting investments. Like always, before we get into it, we want to start with something light. I'm going to try something new with the icebreaker today. Um, I mentioned the Wordle and Hurdle and all of these different offshoots kind of big like a year ago, um, but a new one just popped up on my Twitter timeline and I kind of want to do it together with you. I've already done it for today, so pressure's on. I got it in four, um, but this is called Tradle or Traddle, T-R-A-D-L-E. Yeah, so what this is, is you have to guess which country exports these products they have a total of $14.2 billion in exports. Um, bananas are their most at 7%, then coffee at 6.74, uh, then palm oil at 5%. They got raw sugar in here, close to 4%, nutmeg, mason, other things there, and some knit sweaters and textiles. Uh, once you guess the country, it will give you like the distance and direction. So... You just kind of get hmm. got to get the right geography, and then you can get closer and, and finalize it. So, you have a guess to start us off? Bananas, huh? I'm thinking Latin America for sure. Um, let's start with Colombia. Colombia was my first guess as well. Uh, sounds like I'm not making too much progress then. Well, that's good. I got it. I got it pretty quickly. So, 89. percent uh, It's to your northeast. Or west, sorry, northwest, uh, and 2,143 kilometers from there. Okay. Um, well, let, then let's go with Mexico. I like it. I like it. A little closer, 92%. Last was 89. Uh, down and to the right now. So oh, somewhere wow. in between. Like, uh, my distances are a little off. The kilometers here. threw me okay. off. Uh, <laughs> I had a terrible. Yeah, what guess. is that? Who uses I know, kilometers? I know. Uh, okay, so I guess we're gonna have to uh, go back further down. Let me think. Colombia. Trying to get my geography right here. I want to say like Peru now, but I don't know if that's northwest of Colombia but still definitely thinking Latin America. How about Costa Rica? That's got to be like in the middle there. That's a good guess. Getting closer. 95%. So Central America is correct. One of those in there. Did you use a map when you did I, this? I or? did not. Be honest, dude. Come on. <laughs> I, be honest with After Colombia and South Northeast, I've definitely misread the kilometers went all the way to New Zealand because I was like, <laughs> I thought Central America was to the right of South America. Just a bit outside. Yeah. I'm exposing myself. All right. Now. Uh, so give me. All right, Costa Rica. I am. I'm cheating now. I am <laughs> all right. So northwest from what I say, Colombia first, and it's still northwest of Costa Rica. Of Costa Rica, huh? Well, okay. That that has me thinking like. Honduras. Close. Or Guatemala. There it is. Guatemala. Really just reading off countries, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Guatemala is the winner. So they have. Let's go. There it is. There it is. 14.2 billion in exports, 7% bananas, and so on and so forth. It's a fun little game if you have some time. and That is a fun game. Want to do something. Yeah, bananas threw me. You know, coffee, yeah. I think, is is the easy one for Latin America, and bananas have a similar – they need a similar climate for that. Um, for sure. Yeah, interesting. That Definitely not a commodity that that I track, though, although, you know, sugar, palm oil. Yeah, yeah. Uh, th those are ones that come up a lot. I feel like you can get the overall geography area, like Latin America or that general region, and then you just got to use the which direction and how far and try to finalize it, but – um, did put you on the spot there. You, you got it. So congrats on that, but let's, let's get into it. Cheated with there Google for there sure. <laughs> let's get into All it. Right. Hello and welcome to the map your money podcast, a production of BGA teams. We exist to simplify the lives of our clients and listeners and help you lay the course to meet your financial goals. Content is for educational purposes only. 
Consult a financial advisor or conduct your own due diligence of investing. Calls are pre-screened and the show was pre-recorded earlier this week. So when we think about any investment, whether it's an equity, bond, real estate, business, whatever it might be, a very fundamental concept at its core is risk first return. I know it's something that we talk about a ton. Uh, you can also argue it's kind of a fundamental concept in any like decision you make. Uh, Jeff, I know we were talking about skiing and ski season being back. Looking at risk first return on a ski jump, for example. Sure, that might be a huge feature and you might get a lot of cred from your friends but if you land it wrong you might be tearing an acl or something so that's that's that risk first return there and obviously with every decision but especially in investments so jeff can you kind of elaborate on risk in financial markets yeah yeah sure so i, I like that analogy i think you know with, with a ski drum uh it's always you know how much adrenaline are you are you trying to get your body to produce right versus mm -hmm. what is the risk of uh you landing wrong and hurting yourself that's that's a trade-off that I have to think about all the time right before I full send it off a jump when I go out to New York <laughs> City. Uh, you know, for financial oh, yeah. markets, it's interesting. A lot of people think about risk in terms of, of loss. And I think that that's appropriate. That's, that's definitely how you want to think about it. But you also need to think about it in terms of return. And in financial markets, there's a general rule of thumb. You can't earn higher returns without taking on additional risk. And so, you know, we always evaluate PMs and, and look at their returns and, and try to account for the risk of their investments, right? Because sometimes you'll see a PM that has much better returns than another PM and really they're just taking additional risk, right? And that's the way it has to go. Mm -hmm. So I think for clients, it's very interesting to, you know, kind of keep in mind that a lot of clients think of risk as trying to avoid a loss, but they also should be thinking of risk in terms of what kind of return that they're trying to generate and understanding that in order to achieve that return, there is a level of risk that they have to take. Um, but in general, you know, risk is, is generally uncomfortable. And, you know, to kind of put a little put some parameters around like what risk is here's here's how we think about it so risk is the uncertainty of returns you know if an asset gives you two percent one year and then negative 12 the next year and then plus 30 the next year right that's that's pretty risky because the returns are pretty uncertain um there's also the likelihood of loss right so like what is the probability 60 40 50 50 whatever that an investment is actually going to generate a loss for you and then you know the big one is if that loss occurs, how large is that loss, right? And so those are just kind of general ways that, that we think about risk with the understanding that at the end of the day, if you want to earn return in financial markets, you're going to have to accept some risk. Exactly. And I, I think you can go down so many rabbit holes with all of these different conversations. And I know we're, we're going to kind of go through this here in a little bit, but I think kind of the fundamental concept is if you're taking on more risk, you should be compensated with that more risk that you're taking by getting more return. Uh, if you're not, that's probably not a good investment. And so want to kind of go down and talk about that a little bit more here in just a second. But before we do that, what are some different ways to even measure risk? Yeah, sure. So we have a number of metrics that you, we use as financial practitioners and, and different metrics are used for different things. But I'll go through um, a, a few measures that I think I'll relate back to some of the the things that I, that I mentioned earlier. So first off is standard deviation. This is used a lot in portfolio management to measure the dispersion of returns. So earlier when I was talking about, you know, the 2% to minus 12, the plus 30, right? That's, that's pretty wide dispersion of returns. And, and that's what standard deviation tries to measure. So it tries to measure how much returns vary around their average, right? So if, if, uh, if a certain asset earned a uh, average of 10% return, but the standard deviation is 20%, then that means they can earn, you know, negative 10% return or up to 30% return. That's like their standard deviation window, right? A very wide range. Mm -hmm. Another one that we use is called value at risk. Okay. So this is typically used in like trading desks, trading commodities, trading futures, maybe some of that palm oil or, or sugar that we mentioned earlier. And value at risk yeah. is using that standard deviation framework of kind of looking at how much returns vary from the mean, but it's taking it a little further and saying, okay, what if returns get you know, way outside of the average. And we have some rare market event that, that causes some collapse in prices. What would my loss be in that scenario? And so that's a nice way to think about, hey, you know, 5% of market days or 1% of market days 
uh, what, what's, what's the worst that can happen within those probabilities. So that's, that's a nice way to measure that, you know, potential loss in the event of a drawdown versus just the dispersion of returns or the likelihood of a loss. And then at the end of the day, um, I think the purest measure of risk really is loss at the end of the day. And, and that's really what we're trying to avoid. And so we pay particular attention to drawdown of an asset. That is how much value has an asset loss from its peak, you know, to its, its best price to its trough, its, its worst price. And so when you look at drawdown of an asset at the end of the day, that's the core of the risk that you're taking because that is, you know, lost money. Yeah, of course. And want to kind of talk about standard deviation there for a second. Uh, I know something just clicked in my brain with, with all the studying and everything that, that I've kind of been going through. And I know a lot of people have may remember kind of the normal distribution curve back in statistics whenever they, they looked at that. And that's a good way to think about how standard deviation works with any asset class. And so you mentioned like a mean return, I think you said 10% with a 10% standard deviation. Um, or like 20. And yeah. so, yeah, yeah. And so looking at a, a normal distribution, uh, I, I believe it's six, right at 68% is one standard deviation away. And then 95% is two standard deviations away. And then 99% is three standard deviations away. And so if that standard deviation is a 10% return, so let's just say, let's use Tesla, for example, and say they have um, a mean return of 5% with a 10% standard deviation. So one standard deviation would be 15% down to negative 5%. Two standard deviations. I'm putting myself on the on the spot here. Yeah, your turn on this what, one. Uh, now, now, now I'm just confusing myself. Um, but what would I say? Let, let, me, let, me, uh, let me chime in here. I think an important part of this, right, when you're thinking about the 68%, the 95%, that's the number of observations within a, mm -hmm. a set of observations, right? That, that fit within those, those parameters. So if you think about like one standard deviation, and I think I said mean earlier, but really it's the median one standard deviation, you know, from the median is going to capture 68% of the total observations within a set two standard deviations is 95%, right? And that's going to cover, you know, 95% of the observations are going to fall within this two standard deviation from the median range, right? That 5% exactly. line, and then that three standard deviations that goes to 99% and 1% that's outside of that, that's what's used in that value at risk measure. So they're kind of looking go. at, okay, you know, 95% of the time, our returns are going to be within this two standard deviation range. But what about that 5%? What about that 5% when it's really bad and way outside of the norm? What would my loss be then? And that's the value at risk. So standard deviation kind of puts like, kind of measures what that guardrail is. And then value at risk is kind of saying, all right, extend that guardrail all the way out to the tails of the distribution, as yeah. we call it, and then see what the loss would be. Um, and that's, that's a pretty useful risk measure for, for things like, you know, that we do that, um, you know, loss happens in rare events, uh, you know. A 1% event happens 1% of the time, right? And so you have to be ready exactly. for it. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a, a great point to make there. And so we, we talked about how to measure risk. So how do we know actually how much risk we should be taking? Great question. So this one, like all financial answers, to, uh, the answer is it depends. It depends on the objective, right? So um, <laughs> I, I would say most people have three kind of buckets that they think about, um, creating an investment allocation to, to offset some risk, right? So you have like your short-term needs. These could be like your immediate liquidity needs. Maybe you're about to, to buy a house or maybe you owe the IRS like a lot of tax money, or you just have emergency cash savings that you should typically have for, you know, two to three months of expenses. They say, uh, you have kind of your intermediate term needs. Think of like, you know, two to 10 years, maybe you have a teenager that's going to go to college soon. Uh, maybe you're, you're wanting to move and, and look at a house, but that's, you know, three to five years away, right? Or you have your long-term needs and, and long-term investments. And those are typically for most of us, retirement, you know, saving for retirement. And so that's typically the way that we, that we break down and we think about risk. Now, for risk assets, they, they have very high standard deviations, right? Or another way to say that is their returns are very uncertain year to year, but we know that they're typically above average in the long term or looking at, you know, five, 10, 15 years down the line versus risk off assets that have more certainty around their short term returns, but they're going to underperform over the long term. Right. And, and I think the key, what you want to do here is you want to take a page from the professionals that invest based on different objectives. And those professionals, what I'm talking about is institutional investors. So if you think about 
pension funds, endowments. Uh, I, th I think pension funds is a great example because it's basically what we're doing for retirement portfolios is they are trying to offset the liability of having to pay their their pension participants until they die, right? They're, they're having to pay them uh, throughout retirement. And so that yeah. gives them a lot of risk related to wage growth, a lot of risk related to inflation, right? And so really, what do they do? Do they just allocate all their investments to the highest returning assets and just hope to offset it? Not really. Instead, what they do is they think about, okay, what are the factors that drive wage growth? What are the factors that drive inflation? And let's buy assets that also participate in those factors. And so instead of saying that we're just going to try to earn a lot of return, really what they do is they just match um, their, their liability with the asset that they're buying and they offset that risk exposure. So I'll give you like a, an example for what this may look like for a typical like short-term uh, investment, right? So think about okay, we got a tax payment. We owe the IRS $100,000 and we got to make that payment in six months. Am I going to put that in the stock market and hope the S&P goes up in six months? Well, you know, in six months, it could go down as much as 10, 15, 20%, right? So probably not a, a good bet. We're not quite matched up there, right? But what does match it up? A short-term CD or a cash investment that you put in after the interest accrues, it goes up to $100,000 and then boom, you've completely offset your liability to the IRS and you can use that asset to pay it down. In the long term, what that looks like is we typically invest in stocks and stocks have or, you know, longer term risk assets have a really good track record of participating in inflation and participating in economic growth in a way that offsets those natural long term liabilities that we have when we try to save for retirement, similar to a pension fund when they're trying to save money for their pension participants. Yeah, no, I think that's a, a great example. And honestly, the only question I have is, Jeff, what are you doing that you have 100000 that you owe to the IRS? Hey, uh, owing money to the IRS is a good problem. To have. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, no, I, I think that's a, a, a great example there. And, and that liability matching is a, is kind of a fundamental way that that you're able to um, really just decide on on what type of risk you should be taking for, for what type of time horizon. I really liked how you, you talked about those different buckets. And I think that's something we've mentioned in the past um, with investing and how you should think about investing. If you're looking at something that's a shorter term goal, uh, like a down payment in a few years or owing money to the IRS or whatever it might be, that's a goal in three to five years, you're not going to invest that the same way you're investing like your Roth IRA or your 401k, which may be a goal for retirement down the line even further. So um, I, I think looking at, at risk and again, going back to your point, it, it depends. It, it, it's going to be different for, for the different ways that you're investing. And so I want to talk a little bit more specifically about risk of certain traditional asset classes. Uh, so like comparing the risk of an individual stock compared to an index compared to a bond and kind of how all of that comes together in a portfolio. So you mind touching on that, Jeff? Yeah, we'd love to. So in you know, financial markets, we have a number of different assets to choose from, and we have to be very aware of those risks. And of course, we talk a lot about diversification and how that reduces risk. So let's kind of like go through it, right? And I'll give our listeners a little bit of context here. You know, the safest asset that we have in the investment world is essentially cash or like a T-bill, right? And from there, there's different risks that you can add on to that investment to try to earn additional return, right? You can extend your investment out to a longer period. So instead of a T-bill, maybe you buy a one-year note, five-year note, 10-year note. You could maybe invest instead of in treasury securities in corporate securities or high-yield securities, which have a higher yield. Instead of investing in debt, you can invest uh, further down on the capital structure and invest in equities, which have higher risk because the debt, um, the debtors have to be paid first, but the equity gets everything that's left over, right? So there's a lot more upside. So when you think about all that and think about how that, how that risk spectrum extends out, we look at a couple of individual stocks compared to the risk of the S and P and the NASDAQ compared to the risk of bonds. And then also compared to the risk of just balanced portfolios that has all that. So something that I think is interesting is when you look at the standard deviation of individual stocks, so I'm looking at Apple, CrowdStrike, NVIDIA, right? Some tech names that tend to move around a lot. Standard deviations are in the 40 to 60% range. Um, so in any given year, the returns can vary by, you know, across 68% of the observations, it can vary by 60%. That's that's quite a lot of, of dispersion. And by the way, the drawdowns on those assets for Apple, it dropped down 81% at one point. For NVIDIA, up to 92% that it lost one point. So quite a bit of, of drawdown yes. and loss potential. Now compare that to just the S&P in general, 
uh, the S&P standard deviation, it's not in the 40 to 60% range. It's in the 15% range. So think about what that means. The, the S&P is made up of Apple and NVIDIA and Microsoft. It's made up of a lot of these stocks that move around quite a bit, but combining them all into one platform like the S&P 500 in a diversified approach actually reduces the risk, even though you still own just a number of, as we know, you know, risky investments. So, you know, diversification reduces risk. That's number one. Um, you know, looking at the bonds, we see the, the standard deviation of bonds is closer to that 4% range. If you look at the ag, if you look at long-term bonds, closer to 10, short-term bonds, closer to one and a half. So again, thinking about uh, the, the risk of those different assets, it's very clear that bonds generally have less risk. And then I think what's most interesting is when you combine stocks and bonds into these benchmarks that, that we use to evaluate our own internal performance, and these benchmarks are you know, balanced across a number of dis different asset classes. If you look at say like the S&P 500 versus our aggressive benchmark that only takes you 15% know, of the equity allocation and puts it in bonds, it cuts the risk of that allocation by a third in some measures and up to half in others. And we see the same thing actually when comparing the risk and return potential of bonds only versus bonds with a little bit of stocks. And so I think that's very interesting. And that risk is not just about, you know, understanding what the individual metrics for everything are, but also how they behave with one another. And that when you combine them and you add a little diversification into your portfolio, you actually get the best of both worlds. You actually keep a little bit extra of that return while reducing risk of the portfolio. Exactly. And I, I think it's worth noting that the max drawdown of the S&P 500, looking at this chart, is 55%. But with that aggressive portfolio, it's about half of that at 27 uh, Right. So but okay, can we, can we maybe take a moment to think about why that is? If, if the aggressive benchmark is 85% stocks and the S&P went down 50% at one point, but it only went down 27%, what's going on there? What, is, yeah. is something else in the portfolio like offsetting that drawdown? Can you help me out here, Arsh, with maybe what's happening? I'm going to flip it back to you. You know what you. I think you, happened is, is maybe there out. was some you know, big stressful event in the market where stocks declined and everybody went to risk off assets like treasuries and interest rates dropped a ton. And so bonds actually offset that risk because their prices increased. Now, you know, I, this ain't something I just okay. you know, watch every day. But if I was a guessing man, that's what I put my money on. <laughs> that sounds good. I'd, I'd back you that. on that one. Uh, well, that, that, that definitely makes a lot of sense. And I'm glad we could kind of get more perspective of the differences between an individual stock versus an index showing kind of how that diversification works with just pure numbers, bringing that standard deviation down, bringing that max drawdown down, uh, and then comparing that to what a bond looks like, and then an overall portfolio as well. I think all of that in tandem makes a lot of sense. And explains the differences between that risk versus return, that that fundamental concept that we're trying to explain. And so I know we went through a lot here, Jeff. If you wanted listeners to kind of walk away with one thing or, or any conclusions from here, what, what would you um, think is the most important? Yeah, I, th I think the most important is think about risk in a different way. Think about risk uh, not just in, in what you can lose, but also what objectives are you trying to achieve? And, and sometimes... Uh, you don't want to take, you know, what, what we typically think of as risk if you're saving for some short or intermediate term liability. Uh, but when you're saving for a long term liability, like we often do and here with retirement, the risk is actually not taking risk, right? The risk is actually that those liabilities uh, that you're accruing as you live, you know, like all the inflation and, and increase in living expenses that you, you typically have by retirement, um, all of that you need to offset using stocks which are typically risk assets that people, you know, shy away from because we know, you know, the standard deviation is, you know, what we say 15% earlier, it's, it's really high. Right. But the risk of not mm -hmm. taking that risk, the risk of not investing in an asset that can help you, you know, outlive your money is actually pretty substantial. So looking at the, uh, the past 20 years, the average S and P 500 return was 9.75% and the average return on bonds, the, the aggregate bond index was 2.9%. And so what that amounts to, is $46,000 per $10,000 investment that investors missed out on if they just said, hey, I refuse to take risk because I don't want to see my money go down. You know, actually what they're doing is, yeah, your money's growing and maybe it's not going to go down as much, but it's also not going to keep up with the liabilities that you're accruing over time. And I think if people think about risk and investment management in that way, it's going to give them a lot more comfort whenever they see, you know, stocks going down week to week or, or month to month and know that, you know, stocks go up over the long term. And I think, you know, one, one last point here is if you look at 
the return ranges of stocks, bonds, and a 50-50 portfolio for like, you know, a five-year rolling period, 10, 20-year rolling period, over the long term, stocks have not experienced a negative return. If you look at every 20-year rolling period that we have for the S&P 500, the worst return is 6%. And so, you know, to me, it's, wow. it's as you extend that longer term horizon, you know that you're actually offsetting some of your liabilities and you have a lot more confidence that you're going to achieve that better return. And I think for, you know, for clients, it's think about that's really what you're saving for. That's really the risk you're trying to offset. And so don't, don't worry about those inter, intermediate short-term movements. That's really not what the objective is. Yeah, there's another chart I, I like to show clients and I don't have it in front of me, so I'm going to misquote it probably pretty bad, but it shows the probability of a positive return in different time periods if you're investing in the stock market. So it's like a day and the probability of a positive return is like 60%. And then it shows a month, a year, five years, 10 years. And then once you're getting to that 10 year part, it's over 99% that you're going to have that positive return. So just re re being at that, that point that over these longer time horizons, you, you kind of see that. And I, I think you, you brought up a ton of good points there on risk and how to think about risk in a portfolio and with an investment, especially compared to the return that you're trying to get. And so as always, appreciate you joining us here on the podcast. It's always great to get your insights. Uh, and thanks hey, thank for joining, you. Jeff. All information provided through this presentation is for educational purposes only and does not constitute investment, legal, or tax advice. It is not an offer to buy or sell any security or any insurance product. This is not an endorsement of any third party or such third party's views. The information contained herein has been obtained from sources we believe to be reliable and is not guaranteed as to its accuracy or completeness. Whenever there are references to third-party content, this information is intended to provide additional perspective and should not be construed as an endorsement of any services, products, guidance, individuals, or points of view outside Benedetti, Gooser & Associates, and Beam Wealth Advisors. All examples are hypothetical and for illustrative purposes only. Benedetti Gusser and Associates and Beam Wealth Advisors do not offer tax or legal advice. Interested parties are strongly encouraged to seek advice from qualified tax and or legal experts regarding the best options for your particular circumstances. I have no idea how long that was. I, I think it was like, I don't know. I thought it was side, maybe short. What, Timo, what do you think?